Hello, my name's Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times is what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time under attack in Hesson, the apartment where our friend and colleague Zarina Zabrisky and war photographer Paul Conroy are living has been under attack from Russian rockets. They've been feeding the blast from a hit on another block just 15 metres away. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the situation in Odessa, from where Zarina has just returned, and the international situation as well, and fears of a waning of support for Ukraine in its defence against Putin. Zarina, Paul, welcome. Firstly, uh, feelings go out towards you and feelings of concern. Just tell us what you've experienced both and, and tell us what's happened. Well, very briefly, we left the house about five minutes before this particular explosion because we hear explosions very often, sometimes several times an hour. And as we stepped out and were about to go for an interview, we heard the whistle and the bang. We just didn't know where it was. And when we came back, we discovered that our yard was covered in debris and that our apartment was damaged. Yeah, we arrived where we normally park the car. There's a big tree separates our apartment from that apartment, and the the car parking space was just full of tree. And if, if you look at it from my, my bedroom window, it, you can see the trees are being cut in half by the blast. So this is a grad a grad rocket. It's a multiple launch rocket system, and the effect in a built-up area is devastating. The whole area was littered with the contents of the flat that had been hit. And we could see our windows were smashed. And we came up and we found that most of the windows on our veranda had been blown in. Most of the kitchen windows had been blown in. And and then we went around the apartment finding holes where the shrapnel had, had come straight through and embedded itself in the opposing walls, exactly where we sit most mornings when we have a coffee and we, we, we kind of make our plans for the day. So the next two days really were spent, you know, losing our daylight. We're now in um, a little dark place where, the, where once there was light, but it's now dark. But, you know, it's a sample of what these people in Hassan are going through every single day. And, you know, we're, we're kind of no different than that, but as, as vulnerable to it as anyone. Indeed, but I think it just underlines the risk which you are putting yourselves at by being there, by seeking to report on what's going on, by seeking to be witnesses to the invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, this is the story of Ukraine. There's no air defense, certainly in Kherson, there's no air defense here because we're so close to the Russians that are a mile away on the other side of the river. So they are at full liberty to fire whatever they choose over the river and there's no fancier defense systems going to take it out this is basic artillery strikes and and the city is defenseless i know that zarina you've recently returned from odessa as well just tell us what the situation is like there well before prior to the month of march odessa was a resort town compared to Kherson but not so anymore because the attacks deteriorated and now we have the same intensity daily and nightly. There's a pattern actually at night. uh, The city is being targeted by swarms of Shahid drones, Iranian-made or some say Russian-made Shahid drones. And uh, out of the window, I could see uh, like this sick firework, the red fireflies going in every single direction, and the sounds are overwhelming, just like in Kherson at this point. And during the day, there are several attacks by ballistic missiles. And many of these attacks during the last three weeks led to devastating results, Adrian, because yesterday uh, the city was hit by two Iskander missiles, and it led to the highest death count since the start of the full-scale invasion, which was February 2022, in two years. At this point, uh, we are told that 21 people were killed, and that includes the medics and first responders, because that was a so-called double tap, which we see here in Kherson as well. 
quite a bit. And that means when first blast kills certain, you know, number of people and others flee in the street and then the ambulances and firefighters and police arrive. And at this point, the Russians strike again, hence double tap. And uh, because of that, quite a few first responders were killed and injured. Yesterday, the number of injured is up at around 70 plus at the moment. And this is just a couple of weeks after a building, um, a part of the building was destroyed. I went to report there on 2nd of March. Uh, There were 12 people killed, five of them young children. It's devastating to be there. There's this makeshift improvised memorial made of toys and flowers. And I spoke to families who survived the blast in the middle of the night. Uh, Mostly people are killed in their beds, in their sleep. And these attacks are happening nightly. They are also designed to demoralize the population because the deprivation of sleep also leads to low morale and, as you can imagine, just very, very low quality of life, especially if during the day you are targeted with ballistic missiles. And one last thing I want to mention here, and it might lead us to the whole international support subject, is that on March 6th, there was a ballistic missile hit around the seaport area. And at the time, President Zelensky was uh, visiting with the Greek prime minister. And they were very close to the explosion, about uh, reportedly 500 meters. And there was no time to evacuate or go to the shelter. And as a result, now, a couple of weeks later, I read that Greece is looking at the channels of helping Ukraine with weapons. It's still being negotiated, but it's been mentioned that the prime minister, having experienced this himself, now is more willing to help. So I would extend this invitation to pretty much any politician who is now having doubts. I invite them to visit us in Kherson. They can stay in our dark cave or apartment, or we can find them another place by the river, and then we can talk. The United States Congress has been reluctant to pass an additional aid package to Ukraine. A few days ago, the US did announce there would be a further $300 million of military aid. This was money that the Pentagon said was made from savings from its existing budget. So clearly that is a significant amount of money. But the desire of US Congress to openly back Ukraine with significantly more military aid doesn't appear to be there. Oh, and this is the overriding issue in Ukraine at the moment. We're seeing the direct effects of this kind of starvation of, of weapon systems and it's not even so much the cash most of the cash gets spent in america replacing what they send but on every front now the russians are pushing because they sense weakness they they sense a lack of unity and the the real effect on the ground is there's not enough air defense missiles there's not enough air defense ammunition there's not enough artillery shells on the ground i think now the estimated ratio is Russia are now firing 10 shells for every one shell the Ukrainians can fire back. And the reason they've managed to go forward and to hold ground in the past is a very wise and efficient use of artillery. That artillery becomes redundant if you do not have the shells to put in it. The same with the air defense systems. And over the last two months, we've seen a a marked increase in the, the effectiveness of Russian missile strikes. And in Avdivka, for instance, the Russians have managed to make gains on the ground. It goes back to these blockages, the blockage in the, in, in the American system. Europe, I think, is wising up. There seems to be a, a lot of new initiatives with the Europeans realizing that this is not just an existential battle for Ukraine. This, if left unchecked, will bring Russia onto NATO's doorstep and that the potential there is large. Yes, I'll come to Europe in a moment, but the 
debate in the United States seems to fall pretty much on party lines, doesn't it? Republican versus Democrat, with the Republicans not seeing that allowing Putin to succeed in Ukraine would be a defeat for the United States. Joe Biden understands that. He's making that argument, but doesn't seem to have the authority to persuade Congress to back Ukraine any further at the moment. It would seem that they are in thrall to the potential of Donald Trump's return. You know, this is catastrophic. The Republican Party have shown such utter, utter weakness on this front. It's horrible to say, but it can be tracked back to this, you know, the concept of Trump return. And, you know, that has got everyone in Ukraine pretty terrified, really, because we already see the unseen power he wields over the Republicans and the, the actual idea of him getting to power, I think, you know, is most Ukrainians and anyone who knows about Ukraine and sends it the worst night. Madam sure Serena has got something to add on the um, the American situation. I think all we have to do here is to recall history and look back. And it's not the ancient history, which can also be brought in 30 years through Trump's dependence on the Russian money. But right now we are looking at that scandal, Ukraine scandal in 2019, when Trump blocked 400 million military aid package to Ukraine, and he attempted to secure quid pro quo cooperation. And he was looking for damaging narratives on the Democratic Party, right, on Joe Biden at the time. And he wanted misinformation about Russian interference from Ukraine. So here we have, uh, in a way, deja vu. And there's a very clear reason for that, that being Trump supported by Putin and by the Kremlin. And because very obviously, they're not making any secrets. They're openly supported the candidacy of Trump, which the Kremlin will benefit from. So here we, we, we see these dynamics. And of course, the Republican Party is now being all structured around Trump. There are basically no opponents to Trump in the Republican Party. Let's talk about Europe. And Germany's situation, I think, is very interesting. Germany has been Europe's major arms supplier to Ukraine, but they have refused to supply Taurus cruise missiles to Ukraine. So I'm struggling to understand why they are willing to give military aid to Ukraine, but not specifically these cruise missiles. Yeah, but well, I mean, it, it's hard to work out because every, it seems like every other week there's a different excuse not to give the Taurus missiles. I think this time it, it was like they can only operate off one giant supercomputer and if the Germans donate that, they won't have one. The last night I was reading a scientific piece about how basically these can be programmed with a, a laptop running Windows 2003. I really do not know if Schultz has what the Russians may hold over him. There's a lot of conjecture about compromise. Isn't there the sense in Germany as well, and particularly from Olaf Schultz, though, that if Germany provides tourist cruise missiles that might be seen, notwithstanding its existing military support for Ukraine, that might seen as a provocative act of war and that Russia might then regard Germany in some sense as a legitimate target for retaliation. I think I'd, look, that's being floated, but then you have to balance that with, in the same breath, North Korean missiles are now being used to strike Kharkiv. We've got Iranian Shahid drones, you know, so the the idea of long-range ballistic missiles being supplied, it's happening already. It happens quite openly towards the Kremlin. And, and yes, I think there is a degree of nervousness about, certainly in Germany, about the idea that these will be the longest-range missiles provided. And would the Kremlin look at, upon Germany badly? I think the Kremlin looks upon Germany badly anyway. It looks on the whole of Europe badly. You know, it doesn't... It, <laughs> Europe are supplying the means for Ukraine. At the, you know, that Rubicon has been crossed. And, and I think it's almost, it's not laughable because there's absolutely nothing funny about it. But while Russia receives this 
massive amount of artillery shells and ballistic missiles from Iran and North Korea that Europe is still, you know, the, every weapon has almost had to be dragged out, every system, there won't be this. We finally get leopard tanks, there won't be challenger tanks, we finally get them. There won't be scalp missiles, we finally get them. Eventually F-16s will come, but it's kind of dragged out and teased out. And if the West wants Ukraine to win the war, they have to commit the money and the systems to win the war. At the moment, it's enough weapons to create a stalemate, a frozen conflict. And, you know, whose interest that's in? I think it's a Russian interest because they have the, the vast reserves of manpower and they've devoted one third of their economy to producing weapons of war. So a frozen conflict isn't really frozen. It's about it's Russia. I read recently that there are a number of German politicians that are trying to work their way around the red lines of Scholz. And from what I understand, it's quite a nuanced process in pretty much any European countries, it's not homogeneous. So there is a lot of uh, dynamics that we're looking at right now because there's certainly a number of either compromised politicians or politicians who one way or another more working for the Kremlin's interest than they want to admit or than we can see at this moment. Also, I think what's important here is that Ukraine is not just sitting around waiting for the aid to arrive. The Ukrainian government and military authorities are working on strategies and ways to work around the ammunition hunger and the success in the Black Sea and the overall success with the drones is a very good indication that uh, Ukraine is not just going to give up and not fight if certain weapons are not arriving on time. I think a perfect example of that is what we're saying with what sanctions couldn't do to the Russian oil industry, that Ukraine is quite effectively now taking out Russia's ability to refine the, the, the oil it has plentiful supply of. But if you can't refine it and get it to the front, then that creates problems. And that's happening, you know, as we speak, the Ukrainians have a very effective program of hitting the Russian refineries. On Europe as well, it's also worth noting that Macron He's coming more to the fore and opening up the subject of, you know, support troops being in Ukraine for training purposes. And I think the idea of that is, you know, very much to send a message to the Kremlin that, that we are not drawing our own red lines anymore, which we have been for the last two years. And I think that's Macron, you know, I think that's it's a good move because that give, that's given the Baltic states and the, the Chechnya people to come out and say, yes, let's not make our own red lines. Olive Schultz, it's worth noting, has said that he didn't foresee other European troops becoming engaged in the Ukraine conflict, but Macron has said it, and so too has the Polish Prime Minister as well. These three countries forming what's called the Weimar Triangle, but it's interesting that Macron has been quite proactive in suggesting the possibility of other European troops becoming involved and getting the backing of Poland in that. Yeah, and I think it, what it does is it moves it on from just the, this kind of logistics of, you know, of, of weaponry and supplies. And it, it's an open signal that Europe are changing their outlook. And I, I think it's to be welcomed. You know, I think that is an important message to send to Russia that this isn't just a discussion about you know, pure logistics of weapons supplies anymore, that it's even being discussed publicly is a wise move. It would be interesting to see what the Ramstein meeting next week is going to bring. And also, like in the framework of this conversation, of course, the talks about the facilities being built in Ukraine to produce their own ammunition are important, and hopefully there will be more attention to that. Indeed. Well, we'll no doubt catch up with you then. Meanwhile, stay safe. Tragically, there is death and destruction on a daily basis in Ukraine and in other parts of the world. But nothing brings these stories home more than hearing about somebody that you know and care about. And having spoken to you, Zarina, having spoken to you, Paul, I very much care about your safety and your welfare. And I can only express the gratitude of Byline Times podcast listeners, Byline Times readers 
and people who've watched the films that you've made as well for your bravery in being there and bearing testament to what is going on. Thank you both. We'll speak again very soon. This has been the Byline Times podcast. If you want to support what Zarina and Paul are doing and this podcast as well, please take out a subscription to the Byline Times. You'll get their reports, you'll listen to this podcast, and you'll get a fantastic monthly newspaper as well, which has the best of our online articles and some reading that you can't get anywhere else. Head over to bylinetimes.com and please take out a subscription. Thank you, Zarina. Thank you, Paul. This has been a We Bring Audio production for the Byline Times. We'll see you again very soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye.